Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And I'm back with a very special guest today. Uh, it's part of our expert series. Um, and the wonderful Ashley Goodchild, all the way from Perth, WA. Hello, Ashley. Hi, Owen. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Um, it's always good to have someone else, uh, someone that I've always seen as um, someone who's an expert in the property management industry. So um, it's I, I'm glad to have you on, another colleague in, in the industry. Um, and today I want to talk about what changes are, are happening in the in the property management industry, separate to you know, everyone talks about real estate sales and you know where's the latest hot spot to buy in and so on. Um, and that's all that 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 uh, they always get the headlines, those salespeople. Um, yeah, let, let's try and steal some uh, and talk about property management because we always have to pick up the pieces after the salespeople are done with uh, the the clients who um, have bought the property. And they've been promised this, promised that. And um, a lot of the time we find that what, what they get promised isn't exactly what um, what comes. But um, but let's also talk about changes and where, where the future is in the industry and, and going from there. But could you start off um, giving us a bit of a, a, a brief background about how you got started in property management? Yeah, excellent. So I am based in WA and I've only ever been in real estate since I was 18. So that was nearly 25 years ago and uh, basically started off working for a little agency where it was recently purchased by a pilot and an air hostess. And I didn't even know what got them interested in buying a real estate agency because I had no experience. They really seemed to have just made a very random decision um, to purchase. And so me being a bit of a, a doer, just really jumped into the deep end, helping them um, work out how to pay people, work out how to manage <laughs> strata, work out how to run your business accounts. Uh, so that's sort of how it all started. And with a series of um, jobs, uh, my last job that I had, which is the one I had before starting SoCo, um, was just a bit of a jerk I was working for. And I was just like, nah, can't do this anymore. And the timing with my brother-in-law also having a similar experience where he was working um, yeah. with a, a business partner, it was just good timing for us to join together and do something on our own. So I'm in business with my brother-in-law, who is my sister, my older sister's husband. Um, right. I've known him since I was six, though. So for me, it, he wow. feels like a, a brother anyway. So when I was six, my sister was 18. So big wow. um age difference but he was you know always around and um and he's he is your typical sales agent <laughs> director and um all I will say is that our office is very very fortunate that they also have someone who loves property management in it because if I, I'm very passionate about sales and directors in real estate I think there's there's a place and you know for them but yep. managing portfolios is not one of those places and they yeah. need to employ someone who loves property management if you want to be a sales business owner and have a rent roll. Um, so I hold a bit of a strong opinion on that. Yes, yes. And and, and hopefully there's uh, no fights over Christmas dinner about, um, you know, uh, what, what the sales department is doing to the property management department. No, my mum doesn't actually normally let us talk about work um, <laughs> because we've actually got a few family businesses in with my, me and my um, three other siblings. So we've got two sisters who are in fi uh, finance brokers and then oh, right. um, and they were but not now in business together. And then yeah. my brother has a uh, construction like a crane company, which we were all involved in as well until a number of years ago. So in terms of the four of us, we had three intermingled businesses so yeah you can imagine my mum was not interested but but then saying that we work so hard that when it comes to like you know Christmas and catch-ups the last thing any of us want to talk about is work so yeah we just don't go there because we just we just 
not interested in talking about it in our personal life. So yeah, it's good. It, it, you, you call truce when uh, when the turkey comes out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Oh, that's great. That's great. And and um, uh, when did you um, start the business? So then we started SoCo back uh, in two thousand and six. So what's that? Oh, Eighteen years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was good. And I was, yeah, I think I was 24 at the time, 23, 24. So it was, again, good timing, but it really comes down. I'm I'm very future focused. I'm always thinking mm. of the, the next step. So the decision to start it at that age was very much that I had no dependence. I could take a risk because I wasn't really risking anything as such. Like I had a mortgage, but um it wasn't um, like I had dependents or anything like that, but I knew that I wanted to have children in a couple of years. So it was just like, yep, now's the time to start the business. So in a couple of years, it's established enough. So when I have children, it's not another, um, it's not going to be another stress. Um, and I have carried that habit of future thinking all through my career. Everything I do personally and professionally is always what do I need to do now to make my life easier next year, the year after, in five years and 10 years? Yes, and, and that's why I was always drawn to, you know, uh, uh, content that you'd put out and um, a, as well as um, um, uh, the types of other activities that you do to uh, to help the industry as well. Um, so um, you're, a tra- you're known as a trainer in the industry um and public speaker for industry events as well and and that's something that um yes we always want to try and improve our industries that we're in and it's it's good to be drawn to other people that are are doing that so that's that's one reason why i wanted to have you on um and so talking about the the future well firstly let's go back to the past what what what's the biggest difference you see from the almost 20 years ago um, that you started your business and 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 certainly um, still working in property management at that time um, to what it's like today. I think the biggest, and this is the conversation I was having um, with one of our mutual friends yesterday, is that we really changed the roles of the property manager, and I think a lot of us are still stuck in the the past and not confident enough to um to change so back you you know 20 years ago very transactional our jobs as property managers was collect rent arrange maintenance do your you know four inspections in wa per year um and and that that was it and they just wasn't really any complications and there was less social media and and all of those things. Social media is probably a big factor in it. Um, And it's no difference to, you know, if you've got kids that are at school now, social media changes everything. Where back in the day when we didn't have social media, it was so much less complicated, you know, so your social life and your friends and all of that. So that transactional uh, property management job back then is not what it is now. Now we're in a system um, in a um, in a business where we have offshore that actually does our transactional stuff. They're the ones that are checking the rent, potentially sending out breaches, um, sending out overdue reminders. They are the ones that are potentially scheduling in those routines. Of course, they're not doing them, but they're still scheduling it in. Um, Sometimes they might be arranging maintenance. In in my business, not quite yet, but Mm. definitely aiming for that. So we are now changing our roles into... Um, a more investor focused role like now it's about how can we help that client buy into state how can we help that owner renovate their property to make a profit how can we help that owner uh, create a portfolio that you know is is going to allow them to have a passive income how it's it's all of um, all of that wealth creation that we're providing the investor and We've, yeah, we've got assistants or offshore that are doing that transactional stuff, but there are still so many people that are uh, not willing to move forward in that and they are going, their business is going to run a slow death, unfortunately, because 
we're constantly on this drive to exceed uh, our clients' expectations. There's a big drive to become the biggest agency and to increase our portfolios. And we're always throwing on a layer of extra service that we, you know, that we can offer to be better than the next person. And as a result, we are we are changing our our role as a property manager. So it's um I just feel like people want more from us. Tenants want more from us. Landlords want more from us. Uh, we need to get better at playing the game. And there's no point whinging about it. You and there's a bit of a saying that says if you um, stand still, you might as well go backwards because yeah. the world is just moving too quickly. Um, that you're going to get left behind. So mm. uh, people people really need to suck it up, I feel, and um, and start taking these risks and get confident in this new um, property management industry. Mm. And you, you speak to a lot of property managers. Um, what pushback? Um, you know, what pushback do you get from maybe some old school property managers in terms of, you know, what are they saying in terms of, well, no, that's not my job or, 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 um, and, and what does it specifically relate to? So that um, if people are asking these questions of their property managers, they need to know whether they're a forward thinking property manager or not. Um, so what, what are those things that you, you do get pushed back from? Yeah, so from property managers, um, that's exactly what I just wrote in my notes. Not, it's not our job. Well, it's. I, I think it is. I think it's going to be. And you can cry black and blue that it's not my job, but you're not going to advance your business if you have that mentality. Um, I think a lot of property managers would complain and say, well, the client wants too much and put a lot of blame on the client, uh, whether it's the tenant or the owner. It's, you know, they're the ones mm. that want too much. Um, and, and you know what, maybe so, maybe that client does want too much, but, uh, that's, that is the way that it's going, I think. And the other thing, the last one is that, and, and I do say this all the time as well, we are expected to be an expert in everything and it's our job to educate our clients and, um, using social media as well, where I do try to share lots of opinions that we aren't the expert because one thing I do find in the industry is that as legislation changes, as our court system changes, as new laws come in, we constantly, it does feel like we're getting layers of new responsibilities put on us all the time. If we continue to have those layers of responsibilities put on us, we have to let go of something, which is mm. why I'm trying to let go of some of those mundane tasks because now yes. I need to focus on something different. But then I'm really, really honest. So like at the moment, we're having um, a lot of insurance claims coming through, whether it's for fences, uh, you know, leaks in properties or tenant default. And so what's happened is we're, I'm not used to doing lots of insurance claims. In WA, we barely would get like one a year. Now we're getting lots. And it's been a situation where I'm getting some clients that have been a little bit disgruntled about the process. And I've been completely honest with them. And I have said, listen, I can hear that you're frustrated about this insurance claim. And I need to say to you, I don't do enough insurance claims to be an expert in this field. I am going to provide the insurance company the information. I'm going to be a messenger and I'm going to give you mm. that information back. But I have to be honest. I don't know how comfortable I feel about fighting on your behalf for something that like that's an insurance like you might need to go to the the you know the um is that the fund fundsman yeah ombudsman uh, yeah 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 um you might need to do that if you're not happy and some property managers might have a different opinion sort of on that situation but that's how I've actually dealt with it because I I needed to let these owners know, like, you're expecting me to be an insurance expert. I'm actually, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm an expert in other things, but I can only go by what the insurance company says. Like, I don't know what else you want from me. So I feel like, like having those honest conversations is really healthy. Um, and then I'll get better at these insurance claims. I'm going to do more of them. I'm going to create better processes. And I will um, not just say, oh, that's the owner's, that have too much expectations, I'm going to use that as a challenge for me to mm. what can I do so that the next owner 
feels a bit more confident in mm. that insurance claim. And, and I challenge myself with that. So, I mean, that's just a bit of an example of like yeah. one of the pain points that I'm finding in the industry anyway. And, and with those types of things, it's about trying to set expectations up front as well, because, um, yeah, clients can come in either with uh, expectations set elsewhere that are different to what, what and how your business runs. Um, but also they can have expectations from being a first time investor that, um, you know, a, a, a property manager, you know, they can just basically hand over the keys and they, they don't need to do anything. But at the end of the day, we act on instruction from, from the owner and, um, and we're just doing the, the, the work on a day to day basis to, to save them from doing it. Um, so yes, as you said, we're, we're not insurance experts. We're not legal experts. We definitely, um, you know, uh, doing this job every day, know what, uh, the, the basic legislation is. Um, but even I, I'm sure, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm sure even being in um, the industry for what, 25 years, you said, uh, there's still times, especially with changes in legislation where you would need to, to, to call up fair trading or um uh what is it rewa um uh, in, we've in... got demons yeah demons over in yeah WA. yeah that's right mm. and um uh, to be able to check on what um legislation is uh to a specific situation yeah and i think one thing just with what you just mentioned with the legislation and setting those expectations i think we are in an industry where our clients do now own multiple properties all over and um, and the legislation is different in every state. So mm. the client will just assume, oh, I thought this was normal, but maybe in WA it's not normal. So it yeah. is very important that we understand the owner's portfolio. Um, but like, with, yes, we've got DEMAs and we've got REWA, if you're REWA members, so you can get advice from there. I have uh, always worked on mutual arrangement. Like for me with conflict resolution, there is no point, I don't believe, citing the act. Like that's just going to make someone's blood boil if you go in too hard like that. For me, I always try to come to a mutual um, agreement where everyone's left somewhat happy. For yeah. me, like, and if I ha if I can't get to that point, then yes, I have to refer to to the act and, and go yeah. through all that. But I try to use that as a bit of a last resort and I try mm. to work out, you know what, if I can do this so that everyone is happy and content, um, it's a much better outcome. I've been, I've had a very fortunate property management career where I have been, I haven't had too many big issues that I haven't been able mm. to resolve in-house mm. myself. Mm. Um, and yeah, sometimes you just have to say, listen, like I am giving you the right advice. Um, maybe why don't you go to Demons and just get a second opinion? And if they say otherwise, you come back to me and you tell me and I will happily resolve it, but I can only go by what, you know, my experience and my understanding is, but I'm happy to be proven wrong. And the couple of times I've done that, I've never had a call back from, from the <laughs> complaint and, um, you know, it's been solved. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about, yeah, you know, just trying to get a result that, um, yeah, with, with, uh, that's mutually beneficial for all parties because we, we get asked all the time having a business that's uh, across five States with, um, five different sets of legislation, um, yeah, we get asked all the time, well, how do you keep up with all the legislation and all the different uh, differences and so on? It's just like, well, 99% of the day-to-day -day is exactly the same across because it comes down to managing people, their expectations, and just trying to get a mutually beneficial result. Yeah. And, um, and yes, when we need to... Um, Give specific notices in with you know in in different time frames. Yes, needs to um, uh, be in line and and um, but that, that's what um, uh, the uh, uh, having access to um, the fair trading and and demise in in WA is um, that's what they're there for to be able to confirm things when you have to refer to legislation to be able to let people know that. Um, you know, um, when, when you can't get that mutually beneficial um, results. So, and sometimes um, they just need to hear it from someone else as well. Like yeah. they don't want to hear it from you because they've obviously lost trust in you somewhere along the way. Yes. But when they hear it from someone else, they're generally happy. That, that's yeah. really what it comes yeah. down to, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, talking about legislation changes, and there's been you know, uh, probably a lot over uh, the, the last 25 years that you've experienced. Uh, I am sure that a lot of those changes relate to compliance. Um, how much of your day um, in your business with your property managers is spent now on compliance compared to uh, even 10 years ago? Well, it's actually pretty, pretty low in WA. Our compliance is actually not anywhere near as strong as all you guys. If you're referring to like compliance with smoke alarms and yeah. all of that, yeah, no, no, WA is Poor compliance, all those sorts of things. WA is good because with poor Are you saying it's the Wild West over there? Yeah, I'd go, <laughs> I'd go that far and say that. Yeah, no, we're actually, like, it needs to probably be improved, to be honest. But okay. poor compliance is done by the local councils, so they're the ones yeah. that go in and check the the pools. Um, I mean, of course, the property manager just needs to check when they're doing inspections, make sure everything's working and stuff like that. But generally, yeah. that compliance is ticked off by the council. They have their records, like, maybe every five years or whatever it is that they go out and check, so that's fine. Um, the smoke alarm... Compliance, we've got a very wishy-washy wow. rule over here that says that um, technically it actually says that the tenant should be testing um, RCDs and all of that, but best practice would be that you would have a system in place um, to have it you know, professionally checked. Um, but even still, there's no rule with how often that needs to be done. It just, has, it just says that um, it should be maintained on a regular basis. Now, regular could be... 12 months to someone or five years for another. So that's um, yes. not actually set in stone either over in WA, okay. but best practice is a different story. Yes. Well, I'm sure that will change at some point and uh, it will fall in line yeah. with um, um, the rest of the states. And um, it would be good to have um, some uniform um, legislation across the country at some point in the future. I agree. I don't understand why we don't, and I don't even understand why compliance should be any different in any state. Like, smoke hmm. alarm rules should be the same everywhere. It's yeah. it's still a house. It's still got tenants in it. Why wouldn't that be the same nationally? That I don't know. But even um, I was talking to someone in Adelaide the other day. They were saying how they can't breach a tenant for non-payment of rent till day, like, 14, 15. Yeah. We're in WA, we just can do it from day one. I do it from day five, I think, in our office. Um, mm. So that's also, I feel like it would be so easy just to put that same rule for non-payment of rent because it shouldn't matter where you live. If you haven't yeah. paid your rent, you haven't paid your rent. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then it's day three but, in some other states and day seven in others. And, and so it's, uh, and then there's different different things you can do at different days. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it is, it is all over the place and it's, um, and, and yes, it, it's, uh, we went through, uh, I had a mortgage broking business, uh, for many years and, um, and that was state-based, um, um, legislation, uh, for many years and until ASIC took over and licensed mortgage broking, um, nationally, um, which uh, there, there were good things that came out of that, but, um, you know, ASIC is a compliance nightmare. So um, um, there are other things that weren't so good. So it, it yes, it would uh, it would be great to have um, uh, uniform legislation across the country. But um, I, I think if all of the state governments, but trying to get all state governments to agree um, is another difficult thing to do. So yeah, you never know. I feel, I feel like it would create more trust with the public and the real estate industry if mm. it was consistent um, because at the moment there is not really any great trust in us because everyone operates differently. I think that that's yeah. one of the biggest problems that we've got and that consistent rule um, yeah. would just, it would be easier to educate owners, easier to educate tenants, um, no matter where you live, given that we're such a transient um, industry, um, a transient society. And we even, are, especially more so nowadays. Yeah. Uh, with more owners owning more properties uh, interstate. And yep. uh, a, a lot more of the population are moving um, um, interstate as well from time to time. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that would be great to see. Not sure 
it'll be in my real estate career that that will happen, but we'll see. Oh, come on. You'll be around for another 25 years, won't you, Ashley? <laughs> Do you know what? I don't know. I, I, I love it so much and I wouldn't do anything else, but I would really love to be in a position probably just to be able to still be in it, but not, um, but more pro bono, like, like just to, just to help out. Yeah. Doing the fun Uh, stuff. Yeah. Doing all the fun stuff. I give myself maybe 10 years. Um, I've got some financial goals that I want to meet. And then I think that I'll be out once I've met them. Um, But it won't be because, you know, I've got a few friends that have got out of the industry because they're just over the industry in general. It Mm. won't be because of that. I um, would always like to be a positive influence in the industry. So Mm. I'll continue while I am. you are already. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, I can. I will continue to do that for as for twenty five years, I think. But in sure. terms of like, you know, running a team and and actual, you know, clients and that type of thing. Yeah, I, I give myself ten years for that. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, now, um, that's all talking about the present and the past. Where do you see the future of the real estate? with property management industry going? I see us being a lot more like Owen, to be honest. I I, I I remember when I, you know, met you a few months ago um, online and I was, the first thing I was like, that is absolutely the the future of property management. I feel, and, and since I've actually had friends that have moved interstate while still managing their portfolios in WA, and things like that, and it can it can be done quite easily. I feel like that, um, you know, over in the US, where, um, well, according to the shows I watch on Netflix, this is what real estate looks like over, you know, over there, where people have a real estate agent, like like you and I, we've got our own doctor, we've got our own chiropractor, we might have our own accountant, our own lawyer. I feel like everyone's going to have their own real estate agent, and that's their yeah. person. And whenever they need something real estatey, whether it's renting, selling, whatever, they're going to call their real estate agent and that person is going to sort it out. I feel like we are going to get into that stage. That's that's one thing that I think we'll find. And so yeah. I feel like that um, people, real estate agents will be able to um, not just be a property manager, but I'm already seeing property managers that are selling on the side or selling agents that have got a little portfolio. So I feel like that will be where it and might now go. And buyer's agents, being a buyer's, buyer's agent is, is a thing now, um, a big thing. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I see a lot more. Um, property managers becoming buyers agents. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think we're going to see a lot of those positions cross over, um, and people will use it as a bit of a, an extra little income um, in whichever way. I feel like um, a little, this is a little bit different, but I also feel like every person in the industry will have their own VA. I feel like that VA will be attached to a person. So if I wanted to go get a job at ABC Realty, um, I come with my own VA. Like I know it's very future future thinking, but that's where I feel like it'll go. A VA will be attached to a person and that will be my person that helps me with my life, my job, and, and everything yeah. in between. And um, as opposed to a business owner, like I th- feel like a business will still have a team of VAs, but I just, yeah, I feel like there'll be each person in life will have a VA. I think my children will have a VA at some stage in their careers that will stay yeah. with them forever. Um, a very bit of maybe a bit of a wild thought, but I guess that's just where my brain goes when I think of the future. And I don't think we ever have to worry about like there's been in the last, you know, five, 10 years, always a lot of talk about apps replacing property managers. I don't feel like that's ever going to be a concern. I don't think we're going to get private, like an increase in private landlords managing their own properties um, using these apps. I I think that if they were going to, they would have done it already. And that's not really happening. I just feel like we are definitely going to be such an advisor, a little bit like that accountant um, and and the doctor and things like that. We're just going to be more of an advisor and a trusted agent for people 
um, in whichever thing they need. So okay. that that that's what I think will happen. I feel that prop. Um, and then in terms of property managers and portfolios, I think we're going to look. Uh, we're going to find that we've got big agencies as opposed to those small ones. I I don't know if they're. I think people put businesses that have got like 200, 300 properties probably need to make a decision. Are you going to be a big agency or are you going to stay small boutique Yeah, because I was going to say, you know, if people don't understand all of all of um, that maybe jargon or inside knowledge of, of what you were just talking about, what, what does all of that mean is going to happen to that small suburban office, real estate office? Yeah, I I don't know. I I don't know if there's going to be a place for those people. I feel like um I just I feel like we're going to be big national companies. I I feel like, you know, like like yourself, you manage nationally. Um, you know, you've got other big franchises that manage nationally. I think that, you know, my clients I've got clients already that say to me, Ash, do you manage in this area? And I'm like, no, I don't. They're like, and and but then it gets me thinking, well, why don't I? Could I manage in that area? You know, how could I make it work? Because clients just want to deal with a person and yeah. they sort of don't care how you do it, as long as they're dealing with you and they can trust you that you've sorted it out and that you can sort it out with your network of people. Um, I feel like that's what clients want. So I feel that um, this, while I've got, I've got a lot of friends who are what I call solopreneurs where they've got their portfolios and, you know, very lifestyle they can manage them easily um, and they're not interested in having a big portfolio, but they sort of still are just paying for a job in a way yeah. because they don't, and yes, they can travel. Yes, they can live wherever they want and manage it, but they still have to be active. Where yeah. um, that's and that's not a real oh, business. No, I don't want to be. That's not the business I want to be. And I want to be in a business yeah. where I'm doing stuff that I want to do, and every, someone else is looking after the the bits that I don't. So I guess everyone's got different business goals, don't they? But yeah. I feel like to make to make some good money in the industry, you're going to have to go on volume and you're also going to um, have to have a good team, whatever that looks like to you, um, offshore or onshore. Okay, cool. Well, Ashley, that, that, that was um, a really good chat. We, we've talked about bits and pieces of this before, um, but putting it all together in, in, in one conversation has been great. So really glad to have finally got you on um, and had this conversation. Um, if um, anyone in the industry, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're so active on social. So if anyone on the industry wants to connect with you, where, uh, I mean, is it absolutely everywhere? LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? It, it is. Have I missed any? Uh, YouTube. <laughs> ah, YouTube, of course. Sorry. Um, no, I am everywhere. I, I always say I'm, I'm very Googleable, so you just have to put my name in and find me. But I do um, have a special um, place for LinkedIn. I do love LinkedIn, and um, I share most of my content there, and so that's the best place for someone to um, connect with me and 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 follow me and um and I you know I do a lot of um, support not only for investors but also for the property management industry and I love that yes, space and yeah. I love um I do like last week I actually had four people reach out to me that needed help in some space in their property management role um and sometimes it's just nice to have a sounding board to yeah. speak to someone who know doesn't know you well enough to but they are um but it's a safe place to sort of share a really honest opinion um you know i can give a really honest opinion to someone without knowing all the nitty gritty of their personal life to help them um in whatever dilemma they've got so it's uh, i do like connecting with people and people reaching out uh, randomly to say ash can i just run something past you um and yeah, linkedin's a great spot to do that okay cool well Thank you again, and um, no, date, no doubt we will um, uh, run into, 
into each other somewhere or um, need to talk to each other. So looking forward to that um, at some stage soon. And um, thank you for everyone. Please reach out to Ashley if you have any questions for her directly on LinkedIn or any of the other platforms. Um, and if you want a personal introduction, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to myself and I'll um, do an intro um, uh, email. All right. Thanks again, Ashley. Talk soon. Thanks, Owen. See you.